Welcome to lecture two of week five. In this lecture, we will focus on the monotone convergence theorem. The monotone convergence theorem says that a bounded increasing sequence must converge. The basic idea, I hope, is somewhat intuitive. If a sequence is always increasing, then one of two things should happen. First, the value attained by the sequence can just keep growing without bound. In this case, the sequence is unbounded and hence must diverge according to what we studied last week. Second, the sequence can be bounded above. Imagine there being a ceiling above which the sequence cannot grow. As the sequence is increasing, every step forward means the amount of room available to grow gets smaller and smaller. And so the amount of growth should eventually go down to zero, and the sequence should converge. The rest of this lecture is aimed at making this basic idea precise. To begin with, we need to be precise about what we mean for a sequence to be monotone. First, let us define what it means for a sequence to be increasing or decreasing. A sequence is increasing if the next term, x sub n plus 1, is always at least as large as the current term, x sub n. A sequence is decreasing if the next term, x sub n plus 1, is always no larger than the current term, x sub n. A sequence is monotone if it is either increasing or decreasing. Very importantly, a monotone sequence cannot switch from increasing between some terms to decreasing between some other terms. Just to make sure we are all on the same page, let's do some examples proving that a sequence is monotone. To prove a sequence is monotone, generally, we need to do some sort of manipulation of inequalities. For this course, I'm going to ask you to refrain from, at this point, using any calculus techniques, specifically the derivative test, to show that a sequence is monotone. Let's start with a simple example. We will look first at a sequence whose terms are x sub n equals 1 over n squared. If you plot it, it seems that this sequence is decreasing, so we can try to prove it. Here we have a list of equivalent inequalities. To show that x sub n is greater than or equal to x sub n plus 1, we first plug in the formula for x sub n to see what it is, uh, that it is the same as proving 1 over n squared is greater than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 squared. Since both sides are positive, we can take the reciprocal and find that this is equivalent to n squared being less than or equal to n plus 1 squared, which is equivalent to 0 less than or equal to 2n plus 1. This last fact we know is true since n is a natural number, and hence the sequence is decreasing. Here's another example. Suppose the sequence is n over n plus 1. This turns out to be an increasing sequence. We can prove this by first plugging in the expression to see that it is sufficient to prove n over n plus 1 is less than or equal to n plus 1 over n plus 2. Since n is natural and n plus 1 and n plus 2 are both positive, we can cross multiply to get that the inequality is the same as n times n plus 2 being less than or equal to the quantity n plus 1 squared. A little bit more algebraic manipulation, expanding the product, shows that we can again reduce this to 0 less than 1, which we know is true. For a bit of algebra practice, let's look at a sequence which is square root of n squared plus n minus n. This sequence turns out to be increasing. To prove this algebraically, we need to show that the square root of n squared plus n minus n is greater than or equal to the square root of n plus 1 squared plus n plus 1 minus the quantity n plus 1. 
Instead of reading out the rest of the computation, I will just pause here for a bit and let you read through the algebra. Remember, you can always check out the slides without watching through the entire video. A link to the slides are available on the course D2L site. Now, an important quality of monotonic sequences is that the increase or decrease can be extended from adjacent terms to all later terms. In particular, if a sequence is increasing, for any fixed n, any later term has to be at least as large as x sub n. And if a sequence is decreasing, for any fixed n, any later term has to be no larger than x sub n. This quality can help us prove a sequence is not monotonic. To show that a sequence is not monotonic, it is enough to identify three indices k, n, and m with k less than n and n less than m. And show that x sub m minus x sub k and x sub m minus x sub n have opposite signs. Remember that opposite signs mean that neither can be zero. Since if x sub m minus x sub k were strictly positive and x sub m minus x sub n were strictly negative, from the first inequality, we conclude that the sequence cannot be decreasing. And from the second, we conclude that the sequence cannot be increasing, thereby ruling out x from being a monotonic sequence. To show how this can be used, let's do a slightly complicated example. Here, the sequence is x sub n equals sine of n. For this sequence, notice that the function sine of t is positive when t is between an even multiple of pi and the next larger odd multiple of pi. And that sine of t is negative when t is between an odd multiple of pi and the next larger even multiple of pi. Since each of these intervals are of length pi, you can always find an integer in each interval. And this means that we can find k, n, and m such that sine of k is positive, sine of n is negative, and sine of m is positive. From this, we find x sub n minus x sub k is negative, and x sub m minus x sub n is positive. Sometimes, whether a sequence is monotonic can be found by checking a few cases. Consider a sequence whose terms are n to the 1 over n power. Plugging it in, we see that x1 equals 1, x2 equals root 2, x3 equals cube root of 3, and x4 equals fourth root of 4. Raising each to the 12th power, this is just for the ease of pen and paper computation, since 12th is the least common multiple of 2, 3, and 4. We find x1 to the 12th power is 1, x2 to the 12th power is 2 to the 6th power, which is 64, x3 to the 12th power is 3 to the 4th power, which is 81, and x4 to the 12th power is 4 to the 3rd power, which is 64. As a sequence first increases from x1 to x3, and then decreases from x3 to x4, we see that this sequence is not monotone. We now finally arrive at the theorem. The monotone convergence theorem states, if a sequence is either increasing and bounded above, or decreasing and bounded below, then the sequence converges. Let's give a proof in the case where the sequence is increasing. 
The proof when the sequence is decreasing is similar and follows the same idea. We start by forming the set S, consisting of the values taken by the sequence X sub n. We notice that the set S is bounded above. This is because the original sequence is bounded above, which meant that every element of the sequence is less than some number m, and hence the set formed by the elements of the sequence is also bounded above. Since this set is bounded above and non-empty, it has a supremum, which we call z. This is due to the least upper bound property. I wish to claim that this z is the limit of the sequence. To prove that this is the case, we let epsilon be arbitrary and positive. Since z is the supremum of s, and z minus epsilon is strictly less than the supremum, there is an element of s that is between z minus epsilon and z. Since s consists entirely of elements from the sequence x sub n, this element between z plus epsilon and z must correspond to x sub capital N for some index capital N. Now, for any little indices n, x sub n is at least as large as x sub capital N since the sequence is increasing. This means that x sub n is greater than z minus epsilon. On the other hand, since z is an upper bound, we also know that x sub n is not more than z. If we subtract z from the inequality and take the absolute value, we conclude that for any later index n, the distance between z and x sub n is less than epsilon. This is precisely the condition that we need to prove for showing that z is the limit of the sequence. Let us now give a somewhat more realistic application of the monotone convergence theorem. Remember that part of the goals for this week is describing methods with which we can prove a sequence to be convergent even if we don't have a good guess what its limits should be. As frequently happens when designing an algorithm for numerical methods, we can generate a sequence recursively. Here, our sequence is generated by the following rules. x1 is said to be 7. xm plus 1 is generated from xn by setting xm plus 1 to equal 1 half the sum of xn with 7 over xn. Unless you have seen this problem before, you will not be able to guess what the sequence converges to. The generating rule has an interesting property. If xn is larger than root 7, then xn plus 1 is also greater than root 7 and is no more than xn. The value root 7, by the way, can be found by solving the recursive rule for fixed points. That is, we look for values s such that substituting s for xn plus 1 and xn into the generating rule gives us an identity. Such s will solve s equals 1 half s plus 7 over s. This turns out to be a quadratic equation with a unique root at s equals root 7. For many recursive rules, the fixed point values often have special meanings. Let's return to the proof. Let's prove this fact first. First, we prove that when xn is bigger than root 7, this sequence is decreasing. We find this is so because if xn is bigger than root 7, the quantity 7 over xn is less than root 7, which is less than xn. So the formula for xn plus 1 being the average of xn with something that is less than xn gives that xn plus 1 is no more than xn. To prove that xn plus 1 is still larger than root 7, we use an argument based on completing the square. The formula for xn plus 1 can be rewritten by adding and subtracting a factor of root 7. Notice that when bringing the negative root 7 into the parentheses, which has an 1 half in front, 
we have to compensate by multiplying the root 7 by 2. It turns out that the quantity within the parentheses now is a perfect square. We found this using the formula that the quantity a minus b squared is equal to a squared minus uh, 2ab plus b squared. As perfect squares are never negative, this shows that xn plus 1 has to be at least root 7. Now let us finish the proof. In the previous slide, we showed that if xn is bigger than root 7, then xn plus 1 is still bigger than root 7 and is less than xn. This can be regarded as the induction step of an induction proof. The base case is x1 equals 7, and 7 is larger than root 7. So by induction, we have that for every n, xn is larger than root 7, and for every n, xn plus 1 is less than, uh, less than xn. This shows that the sequence xn is a decreasing sequence. n has root 7 as a lower bound. Thus, we can apply the monotone convergence theorem to show that xn converges. Notice that the starting value in this case is not special. As long as x1 is any number greater than root 7, the generating sequence will always be decreasing and bounded below, and hence will always converge. Incidentally, the limit has to be a solution to the fixed point equation. To see this, returning to the generating rule, we can take the limit as n goes to infinity on both sides. The left-hand side converges to the limit, which we call z. The right-hand right -hand side converges using the fact that, based on what we discussed last week, uh, that limits can be swapped into most arithmetic operations, the right-hand side converges to 1 half z plus 7 over z. We see that z must solve the fixed point equation mentioned before, and hence must be equal to root 7. Here's an important point. You may ask, why do we have to prove that a sequence converges to root 7 when we could have started by solving the fixed point equation in the first step? The reason is that solving the fixed point equation only tells us what the limit must be if the limit exists. To even state that the limit solves the fixed point equation presupposes that the limit exists and uh, that it is reasonable to take limits on both sides of this defining rule. It is possible that the sequence involved actually diverges, in which case, even though the equality holds for all n, there are no limiting values to make sense with. In other words, in situations like this, solving the fixed point equation only gives you a list of potential limits of your sequence. Whether the sequence converges to one of them or diverges still remains to be seen. Okay, we will stop here for today. See you next time.